Hi folks, um, so this lecture is about uh, river and stream monitoring and um, this would be uh, an area by, of ecology that I would have done a lot of work on um, in three, three places I suppose, one um, in County Meath, um, County Fermanagh and in Greece. Um, so we're interested in monitoring water quality. Okay. The thing is, is um, there are many, many forms of um, of bodies of water, and um, when we're looking at water quality, um, and we're going to, so I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, we usually do that because we look at a particular mix of species uh, and other factors. We ha we have to say, you know, is it flowing water uh, or standing water? Um, standing water is obviously things like ponds and certain types of lakes. Flowing water are certain types of lakes, rivers and streams. Um, lakes are pretty complex because they, they fall into both categories. And um, when we're looking at water quality, I suppose it's really rivers and streams. Um, we're looking at fresh water, you know. Um, lakes again can be are complicated because they can be fresh water lakes, they can be saline, brackish water or variable. And in addition, you can to a flowing lake of salt water of elevated temperature, for example, Loch Hine and Cork. Um, why do we uh, monitor flowing freshwater water? Um, there's different, different reasons. Uh, one, we want to see uh, if chemicals wash into rivers and streams in the surrounding land you know, you know, from artificial or even natural fertilizer. Um, and, what, and the river water quality will indicate the quality of land use as well. Um, river water quality will indicate, say for example, catastrophic failures in sewage and industrial waste management because outflows will enter the, into the water and that will have an effect on, on the chemicals that will be in the water but also it will have an effect on the living things that you find. So both are indicators. Um, in some cases the, the chemical will actually um, dissipate very quickly but the the effect um, on the um, on the ecosystem on the on the levels of different animals that we wish to use as our bioindicators they will remain at a low um, and then in a kind of because we said that we you know that we use um, the mix of living things to indicate the quality of a river we can also uh, look at rivers and just in, you know, use that as an as a indication of biodiversity in a, in a more general sense. Okay, so uh, the key issues with um, monitoring um, river and stream um, water is that, well, the, there's this obvious principle that uh, rivers and streams flow in one direction, so they do. Uh, obviously to the sea and um, events causing outflows or pollution upstream that'll be indicated in water quality downstream. Um, water quality is indicated by a combination of biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic meaning living things, abiotic non-living things. Monitoring is an ongoing process which requires multiple sampling and testing and the issue of multiple sampling is yes you repeat the sampling and the testing from a particular location, but you need to do it um, over the course of the um, the river that you're looking at. Um, so you, you need to test first to create a background reading and then continue to measure to see what the extent of the catastrophic event is and how it's been remediated. Okay, so I mentioned that there are bi biotic and abiotic factors. Uh, a list of abiotic, the temperature, pH, the anions that are present in the water, the um, oxygen levels, the speed of the flow of the water, the particle density and suspension giving rise to cloudiness or turbidity as it's called, uh, the altitude that you're working at, the geology of the underlying rocks and then the climate. So there are all the abiotic factors that affect the quality of river water. Of course some of them are related because the geology will give rise to the type of particles that you get Okay, um, climate, if you're a place with high rainfall, that's going to affect uh, things like uh, speed of flow, if the river's high, 
it's going to affect um, things like the pH anions and oxygen level at different times. Okay. Um, when we go to measure these temperatures, obviously by thermometer or probe, pH by pH meter proper, calibrated dipsticks, it's like litmus paper, but it's going to be a more precise indicator. Um, and then probe again. Uh, nitrate phosphate ammonium for example uh, well we, when we, we've got to take actually take samples from the, the river and then perform either titrations or use specific probes for those or or some other um, chlorometric technique oxygen levels is gained by a titration or using a probe uh, the speed of flow using a meter or even just the old-fashioned poo sticks where you, you throw in um, a floating object at one level uh, you note uh, where it starts and then where it, how long it takes then to travel a certain distance and that will give you the speed of the river. Um, particle density suspension using a turbidity meter or a seshi disc if it's a, a deep water. Um, there's no point throwing in a, a, a special seshi disc, it's a black and white disc. Uh, and you measure, uh, for example, the depth that you can put it to until it goes at an appearance. But that's really for uh, deeper water. Um, altitude and altimeter are using your GPS, and latitude again using GPS. Uh, geology is qualitative but relates to particle density, suspension, pH, and certain anions. Climate, obviously, you monitor climate with the weather station. So, um, the abiotic factors that we would probably most commonly uh, measure are just for temperature, pH. Uh, some anions, okay, and we've got to select those, and um, the gas levels, the oxygen, for example. So, the, and what we have done was is we've used um, data logging probes, and um, by the Vernier system, and we just had a probe for temperature and for pH and for dissolved oxygen. So that that was fairly simple, because we can bring the measurement device to to the river and, and test that, that so we don't need to take a sample as such. You've got to be careful, particularly when you're taking samples, that um, if you agitate water as you're taking it, shake it in a bottle, you're going to change the oxygen level. And if the air temperature is quite different from the water temperature, if you take a sample and you let it sit for any length of time, it'll go to the air temperature, it'll, it'll, it'll change, usually it'll rise. Um, the the other thing that we now we didn't do this in um, in in October, but um, uh, what we what we can do is is that we can measure nitrate and phosphate. Usually, it's a total phosphate that we're trying to get because there are different forms of phosphate, and um, we can, for example, uh, measure the, the phosphate. Usually, it's um, a reaction with tin chloride, and uh, which produces a, a blue color, and we can measure the strength of the blue color using a spectrophotometer, and that will relate to the concentration of phosphate in the water. So here, for example, there are those probes, um, and including a small a labeled A there, the spectrophotometer. Um, these are then, you can see standards, and the probes are placed in in calibration liquids in order just to start them off. Uh, the biotic factors there, we can look at microorganisms, uh, coliforms and Escherichia coli, and the presence of E. coli are the numbers of coliforms is what we're looking at, and uh, the microvertebrates such as the protozoans and other protistas, and uh, the micro macroinvertebrates, nematodes, annelids, arthropod larvae, crustaceans, uh, and and these of this this one this particular um, is 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 the critical one that we're going to be looking at in terms of measuring biodiversity. Uh, the ones uh, the first one where we look at the microorganisms is really about river water quality and whether there's pollution from uh, fecal material. And of course, you, as you probably realize, the crayfish and fish and mammals living in and around the water. Are going to reflect the, uh, the quality of the water. So the two that are the the one that we meet most commonly are the microorganisms and the macro invertebrates.
So uh, one of the, the rivers that I would have done some work on um, down the years and uh, we spoke about in the previous lecture is the Broadmeadow River which runs from um, Dumshocklin, County Meath, um, through Ratoth, through Ashburn and then on um, uh, through the small hamlet of Greenogue, past the small village of Rolstown, uh, continues on coming close to Swords and then comes out into the Broadmeadow Estuary which is um, uh, salt marshes and then up through under the river, under the railway track and out to the sea. And uh, what you can see the, the catchment as it's called is within the, the red boundary and you'll see that a lot of streams and other kind of uh, large surface streams which are um, in existence here and as well as the main channel, there's another uh, channel running here, which joins the broad meadow just about Green Oak. And then there's another larger north channel, which joins the broad meadow just to the west of Ashburn. Um, so they're, they're quite significant and almost as big as the main channel itself. But what you see is it's a large catchment, um, a lot of uh, tributaries. Um, forming the, 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 the river and the um, river would be, it's been in existence since the last ice age um, uh, Neolithic peoples used it for navigation from the estuary uh, inland because it's a small um, hop from overland from Dunshockland to the Boyne uh, and so it was an ideal um, route and you and along it there are a um, small number of um, Neolithic tombs. Um, there's one um, near Rolstein and another one between Green Oak and Ashburn. So it's been very important uh, for human uh, transport but also uh, as a source of food because it was commonly uh, trout were caught in it until about 100 years ago. So when I talked about um, looking at biotic factors, okay, we have to take samples um, in order to test the water then for the presence of coliforms. Usually we're trying to count them in some respect, and then also just for the presence of E. coli, which indicates sewage. Uh, when we take samples with nets, and these got to be um, nets that can be sapped to the sapped to the bottom of the river, and you agitate the, the mud at the bottom and then the material is caught in the net itself and we're looking for then the small smallest animals and you'll typically find uh, a range depending on the quality of the water so if we look at for example this chart right and we see if the water is, is clean then it's going to ha you're going to have um, uh, what's called a clean zone You'll have fish and you'll have um, these small larvae, you know, mayfly, blackfly larvae. Okay. Um, you see underneath here they've drawn a graph where the dissolved oxygen is around eight parts per million and it's got a low biological oxygen demand. Um, if there's a deterioration, um, and the deterioration is usually because of it's become septic then what we see is, is that we get um, changes. Um, we get um, annelids, we get nematodes, we get um, uh, uh, various um, kind of larvae, um, blood worms, because they, they have hemoglobin, and, they lack, and because the oxygen level is so low, they're, they're able to, uh, I suppose, um, scrub whatever oxygen they can out of the, out of the water. And um, but you can see that um, that basically this is a progression, and as I move the cursor across here, we're moving downstream. Okay, so let's say that the uh, that there's a, a problem, we enter a septic zone, and then there's a recovery, and then back into the clean zone. Okay, um, we can see that some fish, different sorts of fish. Do tolerate um, poor water, but not the absolute septic, because 
fish are gill breathing animals and they're not going to be able to breathe in water which has such a poor level of um, dissolved oxygen okay um so the, this this chart it can be seen you know you can take it as a um as an you know almost as a gradation as you move downstream okay and um, you'll see that in each kind of concentration level of oxygen there's a succession of uh, of animals that you will find okay and it's clearly the, what the sort that you will find in the septic zone is uh, it's, it's poor okay um, and of course um, by counting up um, all the sorts that, that you find the kind of the biodiversity of small animals particularly the 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 arthropod larvae okay and um, if we look at such a chart this is an identification chart and you'll see that here um, group one there are ones that require a good quality water and they're pollution intolerant so they're the real indicators sensitive indicators of of pollution because if you don't find them then there's uh, then it's telling you that there's a certain problem with the water okay if you only find the ones that are in group two okay then there is it's not the water isn't perfect but you're still finding some we've got crayfish we've got the damselfly nymph okay um, you know uh, dragonfly nymph and so on um, it's got a cellus and so on and then in group three the ones that can tolerate pollution are the midge, flower la midge fly la larvae uh, coronamids for example various types of leeches mosquito larvae um, and so on um, various kinds of worms now uh, the thing is is that yeah, you should be finding some of these uh, uh, all of these in in water with grit uh, variety um, about what happens is as the water deteriorates you lose all of group one then you lose group two until you're only left with group three so it's not necessarily an, an either or okay it's that you're missing group one or and or two okay. um, and it, you, you see the phrase up here biotic index because you can um, there are various um, methods for giving scores to water um, depending on the numbers of uh, types of larvae and you'll see that most of these things are arthropods caddisfly, um, mayfly, stonefly, beetles, dragonfly, damselfly, crayfish, uh, crustaceans here and then midgefly, mosquito and blackfly they're all um, uh, arthropods um so that's uh, biotic index just where you give a score for what what's what you see there is of course uh, another system and it's ecological quality index uh, and that's or eui and that's an observe to expected uh, number of taxa ratio taxa are the types the main types of um, of living things where they have a, a name put on and uh, you, you have your observed that's what you've counted at that particular time over the expected um as you'll see the the issue here then is is the ex what the expected you obviously need to know what you should be getting in the first place okay and uh, the thing about this is is that this system can be used um throughout europe whereas if you have for example this system this is um this would be true for Northwest Europe, okay? That these species would be what you would expect to be used for indicating quality of water, but they may not necessarily work in in Southern Italy or in Greece or in South Spain or so on, okay? That you would be have different species that might um, be important. So one of the issues in in monitoring river water quality is the biotic index versus the ecological quality index 
And at the start, the different types of lakes were highlighted, and we would generally exclude those. Um, however, rivers vary from region to region in the EU, and indices constructed around specific taxa in specific regions are useless elsewhere. So, uh, a more modern approach is to find the ratio between observed and expected taxa, called the Ecological Quality Index. And the important thing, of course, in order to find this, the ecologist has to find out what expected taxa should be. And this becomes problematic if no sampling has been done on a particular stretch of river before. So, you would like to just emphasize the importance of, of uh, recording of uh, sampling water and testing it on an ongoing basis and in general the county councils are supposed to be doing that okay so that's about it um, and thanks very much <laughs>